Hello and welcome to our first trainee session today. Um, so I'm going to introduce our five speakers before we listen to their talks. So our first speaker today is Dr. Charles Soon, who is an EMBO and HFSP postdoctoral fellow in the Schumann Lab at Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Germany. He obtained his PhD in the Dictal Lab at Cornell University. And Dr. Soon's future research continues to focus on understanding and creating molecular systems that can think. Our second speaker today is Dr. Nan Bai, who completed her PhD in the Karanokolis lab at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. In 2020, Dr. Bai joined the PKDM group of Amgen as a postdoc where she started to work on PROTAC related projects. In her current work, she proposes a structure based computational approach to predict cerebellum based PROTAC induced target ubiquitination by integrating ternary complex and Cullen ring ligase for a complex structural information. Our third speaker today is Dr. Xu Xu Lu, who received her PhD from the Shanghai Institute of Organic Chemistry. In 2014, she joined NCI NIH as a postdoctoral fellow and was promoted to research fellow in 2019. Dr. Lu has had a research focus on the HRNPN13 receptor, where she was able to solve the structure and identify a lead compound to reduce cell viability. Our fourth speaker today is Dr. Agathys Subramaniam. He is currently an associate researcher at Lund University. He did his master's in biotechnology at um, Atharidasan University and his PhD in leukemia biology at Uptul University in India. His research focus has been on unraveling the TPD mechanism of UM171. And our final speaker today is Dr. Daniel Zeidman. Uh, Dr. Zeidman started his studies in mathematics and computer science at Tel Aviv University in Israel. He then did a master's in bioinformatics with Professor Wolfson at Tel Aviv and then his PhD with Dr. London at the Weizmann Institute. Currently, Dr. Zeidman is a postdoc at the Fernandez Lab at the University of Cambridge. And now we will listen to their fantastic talks. Hello, everyone. I'm Chow. I'm a postdoc from the Schumann Lab at the Max Planck Brain Research. Um, for those of you who don't think about neurons as much as we do, synapses don't always send their proteins back to the soma for degradation. The targeted protein degradation machines, the, pro the proteasomes, have been decentralized from the cell body of the neuron all the way to the distal dendrites and axons and synapses. Um, with the body of literature going back almost 20 years, trying to understand how local protein degradation sculpted the synaptic proteome especially during mem memory and learning. Now we know that the, the, the target protein needs to be polyubiquitolated before they meet proteasomes. And uh, the small protein ubiquitin was uh, conjugated as the lysine K48 position to create this K48 polyubiquitin tag that is a canonical degradation tag. Now this constitutes only about 50% of ubiquitination in cells. And uh, about 40% of ubiquitulation was actually K63 polyubiquitin chain, with a minor fraction being other pipes. Now, as far as we know, the K48 chain together with the substrate will recognize the cap of the proteasome highlighted in green, and then follows a concerted movement that cleaves the chain from the substrate and threads the substrate into the catalytic core of the proteasome that's highlighted in magenta. And then the peptide is fragmented. And so therefore the proteasome consists of one 19S regulatory particle in green and one 20S catalytic particle in magenta. And each 19S consists of one lid and one base and each 20S consists of two alpha rings and two beta rings. Now, if you count the stoichiometry, the singly capped proteasome would consist of two copies of each 20S subunit and one copy of each 19S subunit. Now this stoichiometry can in fact be detected by mass spec. In this case, the neuronal lysase, uh, the abundance of the 20 S subunits is roughly twice as much as the average abundance of the 90 S subunits. And this is not only true for the neuron, but for a variety of mammalian cells. So it looks like the cells really want to make the singly cap the proteasome 26 S. And so we wondered how much of the proteasome particles are trapped in these other assembly states. For example, the stubbly capped 30S with one 20S and two 90S assembled together. 
as well as these free forms. By using a diffraction limited technique that's convocal microscopy, we could see the 20 s in magenta and 19 s in green. Um, we could not resolve the assembly states of each individual prosome at this resolution, but we did observe something weird already. That is the fact that the neuronal dendrites appear to be greener than the soma, or the soma appear to be more magenta, meaning that the, the, the 20 s and 19 s particles are not evenly mixed in the neuronal cytosol. And this uh, difference can be measured as well. The 19s, 20s ratio is significantly higher in the dendrite compared to the soma. Now, at a higher resolution, uh, at a single molecule resolution using the technique DNA paint, we could actually not only see the abundance of the 20s in magenta and 19s in green, but we could also capture the individual proteasomes that are assembled, uh, which are these black punctures. We look at the abundance of the 19s and 20s in this case, again, um, by mass spec, you would expect 19 But in this, um, uh, under the single molecule resolution, we see the 19 to 20 s ratio is close to two in this case, indicating that 19 s appears to be super stoichiometric in the neuronal dendrites. Uh, now, first, let's look at the assembled forms of the proteasome, the 26 s and W cat 30 s. The density of these two proteasome uh, assemblies. Um, are, are roughly two to three per micron dendrites, where the synapses would, uh, are indicated by these blue puncta. Now, in contrast, uh, 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 sorry, um, uh, uh, primarily we detected two types of configurations. On the left, it was appears to be the 30s, the doubly capped, 290s, 120s, and then singly capped, um, the 26s. Now, this is in sharp contrast to a previous study of ours using the same method to detect the, um, the ribosome assembly and the, and the super resolution, where we see these much larger aggregates that would in, indicate the polyribosome. Now, when we look at the whole picture, um, that we found that about 50% of the 20S particles are in the free forms, and only 40% of the 20S particles are in the 26 form, uh, 26S um, assembly state, and a minor fraction in the 30S. Uh, doubly capped state. And uh, because of 19 s in excess, there's even a greater fraction of 19 s particles that, it, that are in the free forms. Now we thought perhaps the 19 s was in excess in the neural dendrite so that it could assemble with more of the 20 s and suppress the fraction of uncapped 20 s. So using a uh, compartment like the culture cha chamber where the, new, new, the soma of the neuron grow on the upper uh, compartment and the dendrite and axons grow through the membrane to the bottom compartment, we could collect neuronal lysates that enrich for the neurites, for the soma, or the whole neuronal uh, lysates. And then using native protein gel electrophoresis, we could actually separate the doubly capped 30S, the 26S, and the uncapped 20S excuse me, um, on, on, the, on the gel into three bands. And then we could measure the relative distribution of 20S across the three species. And uh, so, uh, to our surprise, across the three lysates, the fraction of uncapped 20S is roughly similar, about 50%. And that is consistent with the, the data from the single molecule imaging. And it seems like despite the excess of 19S, the, the fraction of uh, uh, uncapped 20S is still relatively high, or at least comparable to the uh, two other type of lysis we have. Then we thought perhaps it's to, it is uh, trying to uh, double cap, doubly cap the, uh, the, the 20S to create more of the 30S. Now, as I as mentioned, the 30S only occupy a minor fraction of, of all the assembled of uh, proteasome forms, with um, most of them being the 26S. And consistently, when you look at the 30S fraction among all the assembled proteasome fractions in the neurites, it is a minor fraction. Now, again, to our surprise, when we look at the soma, um, the, the fraction of 30S is actually elevated compared to neurites, and that's completely opposite to our prediction. So we wonder what exactly does uh, the free uh, the access free 90S do for local proteasome degradation? So in the uh, uh, ubiquitin stain, where we stained the K48 polyubiquitin uh, together with the 20S proteasome, um, we saw what we expected, that the, because it is the canonical degradation tag, 
the two uh, the bands that enriches the, the K48 polybutylene are the 20S, 26S bands protosome and the 30S protosome bands. Now, to our surprise, when we stain the K63 polybutylene, the band that enriches the K63 polybutylene is between the 26S and 20S protosomes. And this band is actually where the 19S, free 19S resides, meaning that um, the 19S perhaps has reactivity against uh, the K63 chain. So in order to, to test this, we reconstitute an in, in vitro assay with commercially available K63 polybutylene chains uh, that ranges from uh, two ubiquitin uh, in, in chain length to seven ubiquitin in chain length. When we put the 19S into this reaction mix, we indeed see that it has reactivity to trim um, the, the longer polybutylene chains, and we're causing a significant uh, reduction across uh, all, almost all the species of uh, polybutylene K63. Now, in comparison, when we look at the reactivity against K48 um, uh, using a similar reaction uh, mix, we see that the, the difference uh, before, with or without 19S is much less pronounced. And, uh, and uh, as, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the K63 polybutylene is not a minor fraction of the, uh, the cellular ubiquitulation. And uh, it seems like uh, the neurons is, <clears throat> uh, is allocating access um, of uh, free 19S and so that it performs some previously unappreciated moonlighting function against this, uh, this K63 chain. And in summary, I've told you how we use the single molecule technique to quantify the protism particles in their different assembly states. And we've revealed um, unknown, previously unknown reactivity of free 19S against K63 uh, polybutylene chain. And uh, we're currently getting some interesting results um, to understand the function of the K63 chains um, in local neuronal proteostasis. And with that, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Professor Aaron Schumann, my collaborators in and outside the labs, and my funding sources. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share this work with this group. I'm Namba from Amgen, uh, and this work is a collaboration between Amgen and Promega. In this work, we develop a computational method to predict target protein ubiquitination induced by cerebellum-based protein molecules. To study this protein-induced target protein degradation, which is also known as TPD process, we initially start with this ternary complex formation step. But uh, along with the data accumulation, we notice this step is not the only rate limiting step in this TPD process. So that's why in this work, we try to combine both ternary complex formation step and the ubiquitination step in our method so that we can give a better prediction about this uh, TPD process. So to do that, in the first part, we still perform this ternary complex modeling step which many of you may be very familiar with. So the only thing I want to highlight here is we not only output the top one ternary conformation for a given system, but we try to generate an ensemble with many different ternary conformations. So that's for the ternary modeling step. So for the ubiquitination part, uh, as we only focus on cerebellum-based protein in this study, so we only model this curling four legacy complex as cerebellum is uh, the one component of this curling four complex. To model this curling four legacy complex, so one challenge is coming from this DDB1 protein, which is known as an adapter protein in this system. This DDB1 protein is very flexible. It has many different conformations, like the three I highlight here. So to model this system, we include all the PDB available DDB1 structures, and we generate another ensemble. So instead of just one curling model, we have this ensemble for curling four legacy like complex. So in the Last part of this method, we combine those two ensembles together. When we combine the ternary ensemble and the ligands ensemble, there are two different situations. 
In the situation one, uh, when we combine ternary and the ligase, there's no clashing and there are uh, accessible lysine residues on the surface of the target protein that are close to the ubiquity. And with this situation, we would consider those ternary as a productive ternary. On the other hand, when we combine the ternary and the ligase, either there's a clashing or the target is far away from the ubiquity, we would consider those ternary conformations as unproductive ternary. So the idea here is for a given ternary ensemble, if majority of those ternary can be considered as a productive ternary, we would predict this system may have a higher ubiquity nation efficiency. So to test this hypothesis, uh, we first, before I go to the ubiquitination nation part, we first validate our curly four ligase complex model with the published crystal structures for different ternary systems like BRD4 and GSTP1. And we can tell when we combine those crystal structure with our ligase model, we can always find the lysine on the surface of the target protein that are close to the ubiquity, which make us be more confident about our ligase models. So that's the first part of the validation. And in the second part, we try to validate our prediction about the ubiquity nation efficiency. To do that, we have a two molecule called TL12186. It's a pencanase proteic and it's very well known proteic two molecule that is published by Dr. Grace Lab. It can induce a degradation for different kinases with different uh, efficiencies, include those CDK proteins. So in this study, we apply our computational method to those different CDK proteins. We calculate the percentage of the productive ratio for each of the CDK. And if you remember, the higher those values are, we would predict those CDKs may have a higher ubiquity nation efficiency. So at the same time, our collaborator Christine, she performed this nanobread assay to measure the ubiquity nation EC50 for each of the CDK. And when we compile those two groups of data, we can tell they are a good alignment. The higher the percentage of the productive ternary we calculated, the better EC50 we got from this nanobread assay, which validated our previous hypothesis about this ubiquity nation efficiency prediction. So that's the second part of the validation. And in the last part of this work, we try to challenge your system a little bit more. We want to see if we can predict specific lysine residues for a given system that may perform as a potential ubiquity nation site induced by this specific proteic molecule. So here I show you for C uh, CDK5 as an example, like this lysine 56 on the surface of CDK5. From our model, we predict as a potential ubiquity nation site. But uh, the one thing I need to highlight here is as in this method, we try to combine two ensembles together, the ternary ensemble and the ligase ensemble. So in most of the situations, we would have multiple lysine residues from our model that we predict as a potential ubiquity nation site. That's why we need this UB-fast IC as a complementary IC. So we, only we would only test those lysines that are observed in both computational assay and the UB-FAST assay. So UB-FAST assays, we screen the whole genome and we can uh, detect those ubiquitous lysines that are induced by this proteic molecule. So that is UB-FAST assay. And the lysine 56 is one of those lysines that we observed in both situations. And we then mutant this lysine to arginine. And we can tell this mutant can induce this significant decrease about this ubiquity nation compared with the wild type, which is support or prediction about this lysine residue. But the thing is not always that easy. 
uh, sometimes it's more complicated. So for CDK2, we did the similar thing we performed for CDK5, and we got license six that is shown in both computational method and UB fast assay. And then we perform this set direct mutant genesis, and we notice that at one micromolar treatment, the ubiquity nation did not decrease uh, with this mutant, but it start to decrease only at the 10 micromolar treatment. So one potential explanation is uh, this lysine 6 is not the only lysine that contribute to this protect induced ubiquitin nation. For example, in our model, we can tell lysine 24 and lysine 75 are also close to the ubiquitin. So principally, those two lysines may perform as an alternative ubiquitin nation site in CDK2 cases. So very interesting observation, right? Uh, and that's what I have for this work. As a small summary, in this work, we develop a structure-based computational approach by combining ternary complex modeling and ligase complex modeling. And we can predict the ubiquity nation efficiency with the percentage of the productive ratio for a given ternary ensemble. And in the validation part, in the first part, we validate our ligase model with the published crystal structures. And in the second part, we validate our prediction about the ubiquity nation efficiency using this nanobride ubiquity nation assay for CDK case. And in the last part of the validation, we validate our prediction about the specific lysine residues that may perform as a potential ubiquity nation size with this site direct mutant genesis assay. So in the end of this presentation, I would like to thank all the people that contribute to this interesting work, especially for Christine, who performed all this nanobread assay and uh, Amma who performed this UB fast assay. So thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. Firstly, I'd like to thank organizers for giving me this great opportunity. Today, I'm going to talk about structure-guided apinsertin targeting by functional molecules as a chemical purpose of apinsertin dysfunction. Apinsertin is one of ubiquitin receptors that recognize and recruit ubiquitinated proteins to the 26S proteome for degradation. Apin-30 is composed of a pro and dual by domain. Pro used to bind ubiquitin and the proteome through Apin-2. Dual by domain is used to recruit the ubiquitinous UCHR5 and activate its hydrolysis activity. I was able to identify Apin-2 extremely terminal intrinsic disorder 940 to 953 it's used to dock up insertin to the 26 as proton. I solved the complex structure of up insertin pro with up into peptide. Up insertin is colored in purple, up into in light orange. While trying to target up into binding pocket on up insertin. So I will collaborate with Nadia to use the software ICM Pro to do silico screening to screen about 63 million compounds. I test the top 22 compounds by MR and other biofit assay. Here I'm showing you MR results. This is N15 HQC. Each signal represents a proton attached to nitrogen. So this is the APCD pro free spectrum. I will show you a few examples. For example, after addition compound XL6, you can see signals are all left to free. So this indicates XL6 does not bind to APCD pro. After addition compound XL5, you can see signals shifted, new signals appeared, and some signals disappeared. So this indicates XL5 bind to up the pro domain. Then I did a chemical shift perturbation, colored this affected radius by XL5 onto up into band up the structure in same color. So you can see this affected radius are centered on up into tiny RNA 948. So this is a binding pocket we want to target. Then I measure the, the binding affinity between rp Pro and XL5 by ITC. The binding affinity is 1.5 micromolar. To test whether XL5 has the effect in cells, 
I perform the cell variability in multiple myeloma cell line and the colorectal cell line. So as shown here, you can see XR F5 reduces cell variability in both cell line. It's more potent in this multiple myeloma cell line. Then we try to understand how XR5 binds to RP13. I use the MR to solve the complex structure of RP13 proof and XR5. RP13 is colored in purple, XR5 in orange. So we can see here, XR5 forms extensive contacts with RP13 proof domain. But comparing to RP2 find the RP13 structure, we can see XR5 forms similar interactions as RP2 pro-947 to the tyrosine 950. For example, XR5 central binary forms interactions with RP13 valid 38. This is similar to RP2 only 948 interacting with this residue. Due to the short distance between XR5 central binary and the benzoic acid growth, compared to the longer distance between RP2 only 948 and the tyrosine 950, which causes XR5 benzoic acid group buried into a hydrophobic pocket. After solving this complex structure, we want to optimize XR5 to improve its cell efficacy. RP13 has been reported to be upreacted in multiple cancer cell lines. Knockdown RP13 inhibits cell proliferation. So then we try to include the protect technology to degrade RP13. After analyzing our complex structure, we found the XR5 methyl group is exposed. To test whether this methyl group can be modified to attach a linker, we ordered the, the customized compound with XR5 methyl group replaced with methyl amine group. Then I made the binding affinity between rp Pro and this compound. By ITC, the binding affinity is 1.7 micromolar, so it's similar to XR5. So this data suggests XR5 methyl group can be modified for attachment of a linker. Our collaborator, Rolf and Vakanta, they synthesized the XR5 with different E3 warheads. We found the XR5 fused with E3 virtual warhead give better results. Here, I'm showing you cell viability results. Virtual ligand itself does not reduce the cell viability even at 40 micromolar. When it was fused the XR5, you can see it improved XR5 cellular efficacy with the improved IC50. To test whether RP13 proof is required for XR5 V2 sensitivity in multiple myeloma cell line, we use the CRISPR technology to generate this multiple myeloma TRP13 cell line. This cell line expresses TRP13 with RP13 proof domain disrupted. As shown here, TRP13 was detected in this CRISPR cell line MM1 and MM2. Then I performed the cell variability in Y type and this TRRP13 MM2 cell line. As expected, XR5 V2 reduced cell variability at low concentration, and this effect was reduced in this TRRP13 MM2 cell line. So this data indicates RP13 proof is required for XR5 V2 sensitivity in multiple myeloma cell line. To test whether XR5 V2 induces apoptosis, then I treated this multiple myeloma cell line with a different amount of XR5 V2. Then I proved the apoptosis marker through the CASPA 9. So we can see XR5 V2 treatment increased the protein levels of the CASPA 9. So this indicates XR5 V2 induced apoptosis with increased amount of XR5 V2 cause more CASPA 9 cleaved. To test uh, whether the, the degradation of RP13 is uh, required for apoptosis, uh, I proved that RP13, we can see uh, the protein levels of RP13 was not changed uh, in our treatment. Surprisingly, we found the new RP13 species with the low molecule weight, which was degraded uh, by xr 5 2 and with increased amount uh, causes more uh, loss of uh, this new species up in certain pro, which corresponds to the induction of apoptosis. By doing jet pull down and RCMS, we found this new up in certain species has intact pro and a linkerage. 
So we name Artinsidin Pro. To test whether degradation of the new species Artinsidin Pro is mediated by vegetal. So I treated this multiple myeloma cell line with DMS xl 5 v 2 alloy or with the vegetal ligand. So we can see co-treatment prevents the loss of this Artinsidin Pro. So this data suggests the degradation of uh, artinsulin pro is mediated through VHRO. So here we know this new species artinsulin pro is preferably targeted than full lines. Here I'm showing you the structure rational. Our group saw the, the full lines artinsulin structure. After analyzing this structure, we found a pro and due by domain from interactions. This interdomain interactions will reduce accessibility of XL5. But for this new species, with intact pro-domain link region, but no dual by domain, we increase accessibility of XL5 as well as XL5 protex. After this, I will give you a summary. So we use the Artin 2 band Artin 13 structure. We did a silicone and a biophysical screening. We were able to identify a chemical scaffold of Artin 13 targeting molecules with a little compound XL5. Then I use the IMR, solve the complex structure. This structure help us design XL5 protect, which improve XL5 cellular efficacy. By using this as a chemical proof, we were able to identify new up in certain species. It has intact prodama and a link region. And the form of this new species up in the proof is responsible for XL5 value to induce the apoptosis. After this, I'm really grateful to my supervisor, Kelly Waters, for support. And uh, thanks to our collaborators. And uh, thanks to NIH Intramural Research Program. Finally, thanks for your attention. Hello, everyone. Um, today, I would be uh, sharing one of our stories where we discovered a novel molecular glue degrader. I would start with um, uh, generic and broad introduction. Uh, with the past three decades of research, we have identified a lot of therapeutic targets in multiple disorders and diseases, but uh, that cannot be reached with the traditional drug presenting approaches. However, with the recent discovery of molecular glues and Protex, it enables us to harness the ubiquitin proteasomal system and redirecting it towards the desired targets, uh, expanded the reach of previously inaccessible uh, targets. Uh, the first discovery of uh, molecular glue degrader was reported in 2014. Uh, it was uh, lenalidomide targeting icros proteins for degradation. Uh, this was uh, discovered serendipitously while studying the molecular mechanism of lenalidomide. And since then, a uh, few other molecular glue degraders has been reported and most of them has been discovered serendipitously. And uh, we had a similar story as well. Uh, I have a background in hematopoietic stem cell biology and during my postdoctoral research, uh, I was studying uh, human hematopoietic stem cells from umbilical cord blood and bone marrow. So uh, it's, it's quite difficult to maintain uh, human HSCs uh, during in vitro culture and expanding them is even uh, even difficult. So what we were interested in identifying uh, novel mechanisms that promote stem cell expansion in the in vitro cultures, uh, it has uh, enormous clinical potential. And towards this, we were studying a protein called LSD1. It's a license specific demethylase it removes mono uh, and dimethyl groups from H3K4 and K9 residues. Um, from the literature, it's been known that LSD1 promotes the differentiation of hematopoietic stem cells. So we thought um, inhibiting LSD1 could expand stem cells instead of differentiation. So to test this hypothesis, we were growing hematopoietic stem cells in, uh, in a dish and uh, with the control DMSO, and with the 2PCPA, that is the specific inhibitor of LSD1. And we also used another small molecule called UOM171 
it's the um, uh, benchmark molecule for hematopoietic stem cell expansion that is existing currently and this has been tested in phase through phase two clinical trials but the molecular mechanism of this molecule has not been discovered at that time after six days of uh, in vitro culture as you can see that most of the hematopoietic stem cells are differentiating in the control cultures whereas uh, lsd1 uh, inhibition remarkably expanded them while um171 expands even better later we validated the functionality of the expanded hematopoietic stem cells uh, in the transplantation assays then we were looking for the gene signature induced by lsd1 inhibition and here surprisingly we found that uh, lsd1 inhibitor 2 pcpa induced a gene signature that is quite similar uh, to the gene signature induced by um171 so this is the structure of um171 it's a primido indel derivative molecule it was published in 2014 uh, as a agonist of stem cell expansion uh, without uh, undefined uh, without a molecular mechanism yeah so so far the results uh, led us to believe that um171 could be perturbing the lsd1 enzymatic activity somehow so to test that uh, we did an in vitro assay with a purified lsd1 enzyme and we also supplemented uh, uh, peptide having a dimethyl group uh, so the purified lsd1 enzyme removes a methyl group from uh, from the peptide uh, this releases uh, hydrogen peroxide and that could be coupled with a flu fluorescence Uh, so this enables us to measure the activity of lsd1 enzyme and when we supplemented 2 pcpa that's a specific inhibitor of lsd1 we observed a dose dependent reduction in the lsd1 activity however when we added um171 uh, we did not find any reduction in lsd1 activity suggesting that it's not an enzymatic inhibitor of uh, lsd1 LSD1 is also known to be present in multiple other protein complexes so we thought um171 could be perturbing uh, any one of these protein complexes selectively to evaluate that we did an assay called the thermal proteome profiling in this assay basically we measured the uh, drug binding protein targets in the cells uh, the drug binding either in induces increase uh, increase in the melting Uh, temperature of the target protein or it reduces uh, the melting temperature of the target protein so hence this differences can be used to identify the drug targets we performed this in uh, two aml cell lines since this assay needs quite a lot of cells uh, we used casumi1 and hl60 uh, from this assay uh, we found quite a bit of targets in both the cells independently but when comparing uh, the data from two cell lines we found five candidates that were uh, uh, significantly altered in both cell lines and one of them was rcor1 uh, which is a scaffold member of the corus protein complex so to test if um171 perturbs corus complex we treated Uh, human hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells with uh, um171 for 24 hours and we did a western blot for uh, the members of the corus complex remarkably we found that um171 treatment uh, completely uh, degraded the rcor1 protein uh, whereas lsd1 was also uh, degraded significantly yes i have shown before lsd1 could be also present in other chromatin uh, remodeling complexes can hence there is uh, uh, there is uh, some lsd1 was still left while we also observed a significant reduction of hdac2 as well um and at this point interestingly none of this uh, uh, proteins were 
uh, not affected at the transcriptional level suggesting that uh, the degradation mainly happens at the protein level later to identify the kinetics of uh, the protein degradation we treated uh, cell lines with uo monosaccharide 1 for 1 3 uh, 6 and 24 hours and we evaluated the protein levels of rcor1 and lsd1 and from the three cell lines we consistently found that the degradation was starting as early as 3 hours and it was prominent by 6 hours so this was suggesting the involvement of a uh, proteasome uh, so hence to test the involvement of proteasome we uh, supplemented the eo monosaccharide 1 treatment with uh, proteasomal blocker pertuzumab and we repeated the western after 3 hours of treatment as you can see the eo monosaccharide 1 is degrading uh, rcor core 1 as we reported earlier however uh, pertuzumab was rescuing the degradation in uh, dose dependent manner suggesting that the degradation of uh, rcor1 and lsd1 occurs through proteasome later to evaluate the polyubiquitination uh, of rcor1 and lsd1 uh, we made this construct uh, where we fused flag with uh, rcor1 and we transduced uh, uh, the aml cell lines with this construct and then we treated this cell lines with uo monosaccharide 1 for 24 hours and we found that uh, the uh, rcor1 conjugated with 3x flag was uh, uh, degraded as a response to drug treatment suggesting that the hybrid construct is responding to the drug treatment then uh, we did a flag ip to enrich the rcor1 protein and then with uo monosaccharide 1 treatment we can see that uh, rapid polyubiquitination of uh, um, rcor1 occurs as early as 2 hours and we also observed similar polyubiquitination of lsd1 as well with the uo monosaccharide 1 treatment so so far this is suggesting that uh, uh, the members of the corest complex are polyubiquitinated and directed to degradation via proteasome later to identify the e3 ligase uh, that is potentiated by uh, uo monosaccharide 1 uh, we developed a rcor1 conjugated gfp protein so with this system we can uh, visually uh, uh, monitor the degradation of rcor1 protein and by utilizing this system and uh, and a pooled crispr screen we identified that um, uh, qlin3 kptpd4 uh, as the ligase uh, uh, involved uh, here so to validate this we generated a kptpd4 knockout uh, cell line and uh, with the drug treatment uh, we rescued the rcor1 degradation so this suggests that Uh, the degradation mainly occurs through uh, the qlin3 kptpd4 e3 ligase and this finding was also confirmed quite recently through uh, publication from uh, other lab and later uh, to evaluate uh, whether loss of core risk expands hematopoietic stem cells uh, we knocked out corest expression with uh, crispr cas9 uh, with three different guides and indeed we found that rcor1 knockout expands uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells so all together we provide a mechanistic basis for the stem cell uh, expanding molecule uo monosaccharide 1 and in this process we also identified a novel molecular glue degrader in summary uh, corest complex is a target of uh, hsc promoting molecule uo monosaccharide 1 and uh, crispr cas9 based knockout of corest expands uh, hematopoietic stem cells in vitro and uo monosaccharide 1 induces rapid polyubiquitination of corest members and this happens mainly by potentiating qlin3 kptpd4 e3 ligase and 
this is the first uh, ligand of uh, Culin three ligase family discovered so far. With this, I would like to thank my PI Jonas Larsen for his uh, support. And I would also like to thank the other Larsen group members and other collaborators who have helped uh, with this project and uh, to the fund. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Zeidman from the Bernardes Lab in the University of Cambridge. And today I'm gonna to present to you my work on the computational prediction of protac induced ternary complexes as well as, as protac rational design. So when looking at the protac induced ternary complex prediction, we need to look at protein-protein interactions of protac conformation and to make sure that these two conformations do not collide with each other. So basically we need, we have two very big conformational spaces. And the way I think about it is trying to peel them off uh, layer by layer until you reach to the intersection of these two uh, big conformational spaces. So during my PhD, I created the uh, Prozetac protocol, one of the first end-to-end uh, -end protocols for predicting protein induced ternary complexes. And I'm gonna uh, run through the protocol very quickly because I want to show you uh, some new and cool stuff that I'm working on at the moment. So we'll start with the first step, distance sampling. So we start with the input, very straightforward input of the two uh, proteins, the E3 ligase in green, uh, cerebral in this case, and the protein, the degradation target, in this case, uh, BRD4 in cyan. Uh, each one bound to their respectable ligand. And we also uh, mark here one anchor atom that we use uh, in, in distance sampling. So basically we generate a lot of conformations uh, of, of the product and we measure the distance between these two uh, anchor atoms. We basically use these constraints to run the second step, which is global docking for which we use a, a patch doc, which is a global docking algorithm from uh, the Wolfson's lab in the Tel Aviv University where I did my masters. So you can, you can see here that the constraints version of global docking gives you much, much uh, solutions that are much closer to the actual target, uh, the crystal uh, solution in, in a dark blue rather than the unconstrained global docking. Later, we proceed with uh, local docking, which we use a Rosetta modeling suit for. And later, we take each of these local docking solutions and trying to, um, to build in the conformation of the entire product into this uh, local docking. Because for local docking and for global docking, for that sense, we only use the ligands. We don't use the entire product. So basically, we have this hypothesis for the uh, global doc for, for the uh, ternary complex, but we only have the ligands, we don't have the product. So we basically generate uh, a library of conformations to match between these ligand positions. And we let Rosetta choose uh, the best one of these conformations to match the structure. We finish with a clustering of, the, uh, of all, all of these um, hypotheses uh, for uh, the ternary complexes based on the moving based on the moving chain, which is the uh, the degradation target. As you can see, we got very satisfying results for four out of five examples in our training set. Uh, we also got very good recapitulation of the product themselves. And overall, out of ten examples, which were the ten available crystal structures of uh, protein induced ternary complexes in the PDB at the time. We got very good predictions for six of them, including these two uh, highly uncommon uh, products uh, that still the, the protocol was able to recapitulate to, to a very high degree. At the end, we also wanted to show uh, some prospective uh, predictions. So we used this uh, paper by Zorba et al. when they measured uh, degradation and ternary complex formation of these 11 products with uh, similar ligands, but uh, uh, different lengths of linkers. And it turned out that in their study, uh, products one to uh, five were basically inactive, uh, six to 11 were very active. 
And our results pretty much capitulate to that. Uh, we also got one cluster that was, uh, was included in, in the results of all of the uh, active products. So we took all of these clusters and we reclustered them with a lower threshold of uh, RMSD, uh, 0.5. And you see on the top, which uh, the result which created a very dense cluster, which is basically a single conformation. So this gives us a very high confidence that this is really the um, ternary complex of uh, that, it, that these products induce on a BTK and Cerebra, which is not yet, uh, we, we, don't we don't yet have a crystal structure for this, uh, this interaction. So we also created a web server, which uh, on my, the last time I checked uh, was uh, used uh, more than thousand times by almost 200 users. So um, it's, it's widely used. And I'm gonna share with you only a, a few, uh, a little bit about uh, the new project that I'm working on. So this is APT. It's a serine hydrolase that invo is involved in uh, several cancer types. And there was one product already published. It's, it's basically a, a very general serine hydrolase uh, reversible covalent product. Uh, but it was shown to be quite selective for uh, APT2, which is uh, quite similar to APT1. Um, and this product made by uh, Luis in my uh, current group in the University of Cambridge, he made this uh, product, which is supposed to bind to the catalytic uh, serine. And Barbara, also from uh, the group, measured degradation, and it seems that it does degrade uh, APT1. So I ran Prozerac on, uh, on this product and it gave um, quite a, a big top cluster. So this is, is still a, a very uh, wide cluster, uh, but it was very, uh, already gave me a good uh, confidence because uh, more than half of the results were in this top cluster. I also ran it for the second uh, previously published product and it gave me the same cluster, which uh, increases my confidence. So uh, our plan now is to test these uh, linearly um, led, linear ladder of alkane chain uh, linkers, basically very similar to the Zorba et al paper. And when I ran Prozetic on all of them, I got a similar cluster for uh, several of them, not all of them. And when I reclustered them, I again got a very uh, high resolution prediction. I proceeded with making an in silico library of products uh, that we know how to make. And the results show, first of all, this is the, the C1 product. So you can see a very nice hydrogen bond uh, of the warhead and the length just uh, fit right into uh, the space between uh, the warhead connection and the cerebral binder. Um, just uh, to give you some examples of some uh, other fancy linkers, including this new uh, negative charge next to the histidine, for example, uh, some face space filling uh, example, um, and another option for further derivatization with this uh, bog protected M. I would like to thank my previous colleagues from the near London's lab in the Wiseman Institute my current colleagues from the Bernardes lab in the University of Cambridge. I also want to thank uh, colleagues from the Rosella community, the Blavadnik Family Foundation and the British Council for funding my postdoc and the Dana Farber for hosting this event.